The film you're about to see is a two-hour presentation recorded live by two New Zealand veteran soldiers. Seventy years after their World War II experiences in the North African desert of Libya, Egypt and Tunisia. A unique piece of New Zealand military history is now preserved for all to appreciate. I am Lieutenant Colonel John Atkinson and I have the honour to be the President of the Auckland Officers Club and also Deputy Commanding Officer of the New Zealand Army's Medical Unit. John Johnston served five years in the Royal New Zealand Army Medical Corps. Norman Leaf served four years in a specialised all-volunteer section of the Royal New Zealand Engineers known as the Railway Group. This railway group built and operated the Desert Railway which helped the Allies defeat the Italian and German armies in North Africa. It is with honour, pride and pleasure that I introduce this film to you featuring our two very special old New Zealand soldier presenters John Johnston, age 95, and Norman Leaf, age 94. Hello everyone, I'm John Johnston, and this is my friend Norm Leaf. A war broke out in 1939, an event which changed people's lives forever. Well, it certainly changed our lives. That is, Norm and I, we became personally involved. We were only kids at the time. Well, I was 21 when I joined the Army, and Norm here, he had his 21st birthday on the troop ship going over to Egypt. But that was a long time ago. Over 70 years have passed since then. Events that we are going to talk about happened probably before some of you were even born. They were world events and extremely important. Of this, I can assure you, for if things had not turned out the way they did, people's lives, your lives, would today certainly be a great deal different. The war was fought in many parts of the world but the main countries the New Zealand Army became involved in were Egypt, Libya and Tunisia. And this is where Norm and I ended up. And it is in these areas and what took place there that we'd now like to tell you about. I shall begin with Libya, the country, its past history and location and just what a kind of a place it was in 1939. I propose to outline briefly the countless battles that were fought there, leading up to the vital point when for us, and that is the British, it appeared as if everything was lost. So successful were the German and Italian armies in their advance that it seemed certain they would break through all our defences leading up to the invasion and the occupying of the whole of Egypt. This vital point in time and place happened in a remote place in this desert simply known as El Alamein. By now you will probably be wondering what it was like to have been there actually involved in such a conflict. Well, that's what Norm's going to tell us about shortly. His is first-hand information. He will relate some of his exciting and amazing experiences, what it was really like to be there, personally involved. This will take us through to the final victory of the British breakthrough at El Alamein. For most of us, time spent in the desert was by no means brief. It was not merely a few days, weeks or even months, for there were no tours of duty in our day. When we went to war, it was for the duration. And that for most of us turned out to be years. After hearing from Norm, I will continue telling you about the defeat of Rommel 
and the retreat of the Africa Corps back across the Libyan desert. The fall of Tobruk, then Tripoli, which finally led to the British capture of the whole of Libya. Then to conclude, I'll tell you about the retreat of Rommel and the Africa Corps through Tunisia, leading to the final defeat of the Axis powers in Tunis, thus ending the war in Africa. Now just let us take a look at the positions where Libya really is in the Mediterranean. Here we have a map. We have familiar Spain, Italy, Greece, Turkey, and over here we have Algeria and Egypt, and right here is Libya. What sort of a place is Libya? Well, in one word, sand. Practically the whole of the Libya is covered with sand. In fact, the, the, it, below is the Sahara, becomes the Sahara Desert. Over here is Egypt. So all this huge mass of land is all virtually just sand. The type of terrain is from the coast, working inwards. The coastline is a sort of a mixture of rock and gravel and sand and bits of scrubby bits of growth, just inches high. Just one feature are our escarpments. These are sort of flat-topped hills about 100, 200 feet that rise in, in various areas along the coast. But they only form a very small part of the, of the area. As you get further inland, the rocks start to become smaller and finally you just have sand and gravel and then you have just pure sand which is often, it's quite flat at times, you can drive, drive over it almost like a billiard table. And then that sand becomes into sort of dunes and becomes more ridges. And further in, of course, these ridges become bigger and bigger till finally it becomes the sand dunes of the Sahara Desert. That's, that's right down here. In, in general, the main fighting took place in this area here. When we got deeper into the desert at times, the trucks would become stuck. This is a picture I took of our convoy when we would have pulled off for perhaps a morning break or lunch break. And it gives a very typical view of major part of the desert where the war was fought. You'll see it's perfectly flat, goes on forever. There's gravelly bits here, bits of scrub, never really grew much bigger than that. And that finally disappears, of course, as you get deeper into the desert. The trucks used to sometimes get stuck in the sand. And we carried these rails that you see on the side here. These are sand trays. There's one on each side of the car. And they would be stuffed under the back wheels and, and we'd, that's how we'd get ourselves out of it. There are no roads or towns. It, it, it's an amazing place. The, the only life is along the coastline and people don't live there. It is, it is completely empty, apart from probably a few wandering Bedouin tribes and camels. But it basically, there's, there's nobody lives in this area at all. It's amazing. All the life is along this road here. The towns, there's Tripoli, the main city, uh, Benghazi, and Tobruk, and the little villages between them. Originally, these towns were connected with a gravel road, but when Mussolini invaded, he built a tarsial road, which went from the border of, of Tunisia right through to the border of Egypt. My impressions of the desert, well, it's just one hell of a place to live, but it is beautiful. 
visually, I was enchanted with it. It's beautifully pure and clean and simplistic. Many years ago, an American correspondent went to the area to interview a Lawrence of Arabia. And he said to Lawrence, what do, what do you like about the desert? What's so much about the desert do you like? And Lawrence replied, it's clean. And that's just exactly what it is. You put your hand down and pick up some sand, golden sand, and you hold it up and it trickles out of your hand. Beautiful. And you open your hand and it's it's just perfectly. Some years later, 60 years as a matter of fact, I decided to write a book about my experiences. That wasn't hard because uh, that's something you never forget. Isn't that right, Norm? That is correct. Yes. And I was, uh, came to the part where I was describing the desert and I found it extremely difficult to put it in words. Well, I'd taken hundreds of pictures and I had plenty of the deserts, but of course they were all in black and white and they couldn't describe what I was trying to get over to the, my readers. So I decided to paint some little pictures and include those in the book and this will give you a bit of an idea of what I saw. This is the picture of the desert, normally, beautiful colours and the rocks and the foreground, very simplistic, lovely. And then these are the escarpments along the coast, beautiful elongated symmetrical lines which break the, break the scenery up, rather, rather beautiful. And getting deeper into the desert, this is my graphic interpretation of the desert dunes, one triangle behind the other, going away into the distance, beautiful. And this looks rather overdone, and I, I agree with you, but it really was like that. The sun went down in a brilliant red ball, it was, it was gorgeous. And the silence, that was another thing, of course, when the, when the war wasn't going on. And so these are just impressions of another side of the desert to what we had, but of course didn't have much chance to experience. There is one feature in the there's a, this is this little knob here, and I'll talk about it because it does come into the story, but essentially the access is round the coastline. This plateau is about three or four hundred feet high and it was cultivated. Mussolini sent his colonists there but there was never really any fighting there. This is a picture taken when the war had finished in North Africa and the New Zealand convoy was on its way back to Egypt. And here we are coming up onto this plateau. You can see the, the trucks winding their way up. This is down on the level. This is the ocean out here. And Benghazi is just over in this area over here. This will give you a little bit of an idea of the territory in that. It's, it's quite a bit of vegetation in this part. It's quite unique to the rest of the desert. Now let us look a little bit at the history of the area. Mussolini came into power in 1922 in Italy and his promise to the nation was to restore Italy back to the glory of the Roman Empire. And to do this, of course, he had to occupy some of the lands which were once part of the Roman Empire. The first place he chose was Libya. He didn't have much trouble invading Libya because it was only occupied by wandering tribes of Arabs, Bedouins, people like that. And he colonized it with um, Italian peasants mainly. And in a lot of areas he pushed the desert back just by putting water and cultivated it, grew olive groves. Then his further 
ambitions were to expand and he was looked at Abyssinia down here and he finally invaded Abyssinia and conquered the country. It wasn't very hard because the Abyssinians just sort of rode on horseback with spears. And he had guns and aeroplanes and mechanism. And there was a, there was a an accusation that he actually used poison gas. However, so though he had Libya, Abyssinia, and his next sites were on Egypt. This was very, very important because with Egypt goes the Suez Canal. And then his idea was to move through into Asia and the Germans would come down through the Balkans and they would join up. In the meantime, of course, when this was all going on, uh, Hitler came into power and the Nazis. And their ideas, Mussolini's ideas and Hitler's ideas were very similar. And in fact, the history relates that Hitler originally was an admirer of Mussolini. But of course, that all changed later on. Hitler was, as we know, was very successful at the beginning and invaded France and there was a tragedy of Dunkirk and at that time Mussolini decided to join forces and that became of course the, the Axis powers. In June of 1940 Italy then declared war on Britain and it was at that stage, of course, that Mussolini wanted to Im impress Hitler very much and de decided then to invade Egypt. The invasion of Egypt took place in September of 1940. They were, he had a powerful force of uh, 120,000. And the British defence was only around about 36. However, the Italian soldiers were not really trained. They were not good soldiers, they were untrained, they were just mainly peasants. And the Italian equipment was exceedingly poor, not suitable for desert warfare at all. During the invasion, here's Tobruk, he came in through here, here's the border and he advanced 60 miles to Sidi Barani, where he stopped to reform. The Italian army was led by a General Graziani, and he was rather wary of the British. He knew they, they didn't have the numbers, but they, they had the knowledge, and they were building up very, very quickly. And Mussolini pressed him to push on and push on, but he hesitated. And during this hesitation of a few months, the British built up enough power to attack. And they broke through the Italian lines. And then with a big advance, the Australians came in and they took Saloum. And the rest of the British army turned round and attacked the Italians from the back. And 80,000 prisoners were taken. It was, a, it was a terrible defeat for the Italians. And then after that, they just turned on their tails and started to run back the desert, right along here. The pursuit went on. The British hired on their tails. Right round through Tobruk. Tobruk was recaptured. Right round the road here, as you see, right round this knob, Jebel Kabul, which I was telling you about previously. Then the British had an idea. A General O'Connor decided to send a small force, a small, a small um, infantry force, backed by the uh, 5th Armoured Brigade, and do a shortcut. It's never been done before, down through the bottom here. It had been surveyed by the Long Range Desert Group. As the Italians were retreating, and since the whole of the Italian army were retreating round the coast, 
This column, the fifth armored division, shot through here, and they were waiting here for the Italians when they came round, and they trapped the whole lot of them. 130,000 prisoners were taken. It was a colossal defeat for the Italian army. Well, you would think now at this stage, the idea would have been to have their round at this point here, just, just past Benghazi, Alagilia. Tripoli is just out of this picture. The idea would have been to have pressed on. But then politics took over. Years earlier, the Greece had been worried about some future invasion. And Britain had promised to defend them and help them if ever they were invaded. And unfortunately, at this particular time, Germany decided to invade Greece. And the king of Greece called on Churchill to help. Well, the British had made the promise and they wanted to, to carry on with this promise. But of course, they were in dire straits themselves. They'd just suffered defeat in France, had been to Dunkirk. They had no troops to spare. But to honour the promise, Churchill decided to pull troops out of El Argelia, where we were, and shoot them over to Greece. And that also included the New Zealand Division, who were at that, that time had just come to fighting strength. And of course, we all know what happened about Greece and Crete. Then at the same time, Hitler took pity and was rather embarrassed about the loss of the Italians in the, in the desert. And he decided to divert a whole of a corps which was being trained for Russia to Libya. And that, of course, became the Africa Corps. And as leader, well, he chose his favourite, Rommel. Well, now the whole picture changes, because now we are up against Rommel and the Africa Corps. Now, you'd think that Libya would be a perfect place to have a war. I mean, say so there's nobody there, so there's no civilians, there's no towns. It's just a big area of land, and two armies can get together and scrap. And that's really virtually what happened. They just came together. But Libya was rather unusual because there's, there's no way where you can set up a natural defence. It's, it's, it's just flat land. So when you retreat, you, 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 you can't retreat into the hills or gullies or set up a line of defence. So they just used to sort of dig themselves in and build barbed wire and throw around mines and niggle away at each other, and this, this actually did happen for months, niggling away at each other. But this very, very interesting situation happens here. When the enemy attacks, the defeated can do really nothing much else than pick up their guns and start running backwards. And this happened time and time again on both sides. You see, we'll suggest that the war is taking place, being fought here on the border. Germans are being supplied by Tripoli. British are being supplied by Alexandria. So you have them, say, in the middle here. And the Germans attack and are successful. So the British retreat and the Germans come in after them. Now what actually happens then, their line of supply starts to get longer and longer. And we're talking about hundreds of miles here. And it's all got to be brought along this one road. So it's getting more difficult and more difficult to keep up with the army. On the other hand, the defeated, say the British, they're falling back on their reserves. They're getting closer and closer to their reserves in Alexandria. 
So it gets easier for the retreated and harder for the, for the ones advancing. And that was one of the peculiar parts about the war in North Africa because it did happen and that's why it surged backwards and forwards all the time. After Rommel took over, shortly, very shortly after, about a month later, he attacked the British right here in Elagelia and the British fell back to the border where they established a line of defence. From there on, spasmodic fighting took place, backwards and forwards, and later on, a few months later, the British were able to build up enough force and they attacked again and <laughs> drove them back to almost to Alagelia where they'd once been before. It just gives you an idea how the battles in the desert swung backwards and forwards. So here we are now, we're back in for the second time, back in almost exactly the same area, Elagelia. Here's Benghazi here. I had the opportunity once to visit Benghazi. It was very interesting. This is a picture of the cathedral there, and I was very taken with the eastern aspect of the building, with the two domes. And another thing that interested me was the way it had survived the bombing. Benghazi had, was a port and it was being, being bombed, but the cathedral seemed to have missed and it reminded me of that very famous picture of London and St Paul's after a blitz and the smoke coming up. It's a very famous picture and it's very, very similar. Later on, after I'd taken this picture, later on in the evening, almost at uh, nightfall, I was sitting in my tent and I'd, we were in the desert about a mile out of the... And I saw this beautiful scene looking right across the desert. Here, here's the domes of the cathedral. And of course we have the lovely tracks of the uh, trucks left their tyre marks in the sand. Well, here we are now at th this area here. Just Benghazi, Rommel attacks, drives the British back to the Gazala line, which is it's, it's just it's just a line about there, where the British consolidate and hold him up. And for the next three or four months, spasmodic fighting goes on. But Rommel is very successful in building up his supplies and, and he's becoming, by this time, very, very powerful. And by June, he attacks again. He wanted to use his Tiger tanks and draw the British out into a battle, which he successfully did. The British had Grants. The Tigers and the Grants had the same size gun, 75 millimetre, but the British gun was mounted on the tank itself. So when the tank came forward to aim, it had to manoeuvre. Whereas the Tiger gun was mounted on a turret. So all the tank had to do was to charge forward and his gun could swivel round. He drew Britain out into a battle and they lost 80 tanks out of 100. And it was a tremendous defeat for the British. This was the very start of the retreat to Alamein. He then went in with the infantry and managed to break the British line. He attacked further up the Gazala line, took Tobruk, and then the whole of the German Africa Corps then charged across the desert here. The British at that time were in full retreat. It was thought that perhaps at long last Rommel and the Africa Corps would break through and take Egypt. But then, of course, he came up against a couple of real problems. Previously, he had all of the desert to play with. Now he was going to be confined to a small area here, brought about by this picture here, and that is a great big depression in the land. If it was in an ordinary place, it would be a big lake full of water. But this is full of loose sand. 
and it's impossible for man or machine to get through. So he had to come through this gap. Now that is the first thing. The second thing is this. His line of supply was now nearly a thousand miles away. He had to bring his supplies in from Tripoli, right away back here. The British were only 60 miles from their base. In the meantime, Britain had regained control of the Mediterranean. And the Navy was sinking, sinking his supply ships. And we also had a Malta. So we were attacking him from the air. So Rommel had a very, very big problem on his hands. Although he was, appeared to be very victorious, he had a very, very big problem on his hand. He was desperately short of supplies because it's an immense amount of material required to keep an army in the field. It's, it's colossal. I could, never, I could never imagine when I was there how they actually did it. Well, at this stage, I'm going to hand you over to Norm because Norm was actually right there at this particular time. And he's going to tell you a few very, very personal incidents of his experiences there. So this is an eyewitness account. Thank you, John, for your kind words. I'd like to point out that John was a professional photographer before World War II. And as you can see, an accomplished artist and author. I have been asked what I was doing in the desert. Well, as I had been in the New Zealand Locomotive Division of the New Zealand Railways, it seemed the obvious thing to join the railway company, although they were non-divisional. So I did. The first job was we got in Egypt was shadowing the Egyptian crews who were most unreliable. Egypt was not at war. If an enemy plane came over, it was not uncommon for the Egyptian crew to leave the train in the middle of the desert until the danger had passed. So we took it on. They didn't like to be left behind. Little was known of the 10th and 13th construction and the 16th and 17th railway operating companies as they were non-divisional and under the British command for the whole time. Even though they were all New Zealanders, they came under the General Freiburg for pay, discipline, rations and uniform, but for all else under the command of GHQ Middle East. In Libya, there was over 500 miles of poor coastal roads and lack of motor transport due to the early stages of the war. Rail was an absolute necessity. The Egyptian rail only went as far as Merzema True. There was a huge 700 foot escarpment that both the English and Egyptian engineers said was impossible to pass. Lieutenant Mackay of the 9th New Zealand Survey Company surveyed a suitable passage through the escarpment. The 10th and 13th construction not only built this, but continued approximately 225 miles to El Adam, south of Tobruk. They also achieved laying four miles of track in one day, a world record. The New Zealand operating companies, 16th and 17th, covered the distance, achieving a tonnage of from two to 4,000 tonnes per day, at times being under heavy attack from German and Italian fighters. In the early stages, we had 24 engines put out of service in seven days. Improved defence from four bread guns, 
which were replaced by Italian breeders, Akiak, captured guns, and was later replaced by British barrage balloons, improved the situation over the years. Field Marshal Rommel stated in his memoirs, the greatest advantage the Eighth Army had was the Desert Railway. A great compliment from a great general. I will now give something of the lead up to the Battle of El Alamein as it affected me, starting with the Great Retreat. This was when Rommel started his race to the Suez Canal in Egypt. If he had been successful at that stage, it is possible England would have capitulated or starved, for it would have completed the pincher movement to Russia and cut off England's lifeline. I had been about two years in the Middle East when the Great Retreat took place. At the time, we were doing a recovery job at El Adam, a small aerodrome south of Tobruk. A huge collection of armour was forming up on the city Rizis hillside. A tank officer came down and wanted to know what we were doing as a huge tank battle was likely to take place at any moment. The Germans were just over the hill. Fortunately, our DDR, or dispatch rider, arrived with orders to return to our unit as the company were moving at 10 a.m. If we were not there by that time, bad luck, we would probably be in the bag, prisoners of war. Twice on the way back, we were fired on by German flying columns, but made the grade back with 10 minutes to spare. Everything seemed to have gone mad. Everyone was going in the wrong direction. Transport, planes, the world seemed to be upside down. There appeared to be little organisation or direction. By the time we had passed Mishifa, there was approximately nine trains, one behind the other. And only the driver and fireman at the front of each to control the situation. We just could not leave any rolling stock that the Germans could use. One engine that was out of steam, we put a charge in the firebox to render it useless. Very different, as they were cab scenes and the not too friendly enemy above. I've often wondered why the Germans did not attempt to blow the track ahead of us. Wonders never cease. We covered the approximately 225 miles and camped at Simla, near Mersamatru, where we met the New Zealand Division coming up. The division had left Syria, where they were resting on the 16th of June, 1942, to return urgently to Egypt, covering the distance in approximately 200 mile hops each day. The New Zealand Division was possibly the only troops capable of stopping the German advance to Egypt and the canal. Rommel knew where they were and his estimate of time for them to reach Egypt was five days. They did it in four, camping at Mesmetru. On the 23rd of June, the advancing Germans passed Charing Cross, which was an English name, but was at the top of the escarpment. Shortly after, the division was attacked by 32 Stuka dive bombers. So they moved to Minga Kwam, a more suitable defence position. On the 26th of June, 
they were completely surrounded. And the General Freiburg knew the German attack would be the next day. The Germans could at that stage have possibly wiped the New Zealand division out. Freiburg decided that there was no, as there was no moon that night, and the Germans were tired by their weeks of fighting and driving, this was the ideal time for the breakout. The 28th Maori Battalion spearheaded the attack. The shots, no shots, were to be fired at least fired upon. But action would be with the cold steel of the bayonet. I was told it was a horrible scene. This is the reason the news media several years ago claimed that the New Zealand division bayoneted German doctors and nurses. And in the pitch black night, this could have been so. When the moon shines in the desert, it's like day. But when there is no moon, it's pitch black. The division successfully broke out and safely reached El Alamein with the last line of defence, and I mean the last line of defence, had been prepared and the build-up of armour and supplies commenced. The 17th Railway Company had by this time reached Amaria, where it remained until November 1942. Amaria was approximately 20 miles east of El Alamein. Working to the El Alamein station, bringing a steady supply of foodstuffs to tanks and artillery equipment. This is why the Al Alamein station and the tree which is beside it is so important to me as a landmark. The station master claimed that he had planted the tree, watered it, and he claimed it was the only tree in the western desert at the time. I believe him to be correct. On the screen is a map showing in particular the Quata Depression. This is a huge sea of quicksand and deprived Rommel of his favourite attack and an encircling movement and possibly assisted in the final result. Our stay at Amaria was from mid-July 1942 until November 1942. The first battle of El Alamein took place on the 15th of July 1942 without any noticeable result. A visit by Churchill and a change of command to General Montgomery made some noticeable changes. At that stage, we wondered whether it was good or bad, for he was a fitness fanatic. In the meantime, our company was subjected to a sabotage attack by Italian frogmen. They landed by submarine east of El Alamein to blow a section of rail at a curve, but fortunately, their lack of experience meant they blew a section from the inside of the curve instead of the outside. The latter would have caused a serious accident, for we put three trains over it before discovery. This was the third such attack, and the first being in the Yumuk Valley in Syria, where we were backing the Australian division. It is interesting to note no arrangements were made for the escape of the saboteurs, as they expected Rommel to march triumphantly through Alexandra in a, in a few days. They were all taken prisoners. Our build-up continued. 
we would run a train into El Alamein station. All the Army Service Corps would line up on either side to unload. The train and trucks would be gone in about 15 to 20 minutes. As this was right under the, and within range of the German guns, mostly at night, it's a wonder we were never discovered and caught. The second battle of El Alamein took place on the 23rd of October. We will never forget the roar of over 900 British 25 pounders firing continuously for three days and nights. At night, the whole front was lit up like day and the flash of the guns, a memory that will never leave me. After the breakthrough at El Alamein, we set to repairing the line where it had been torn up, also lifting mines by South African engineers that the Germans had placed under our track, then racing to keep up with the rapidly moving 8th Army. It was not long before we were back to our supply of two to 4,000 tonnes per day, finally reaching Fort Capuza, El Adam. Let us now reflect on the wonderful life in the desert through the eyes of a man who could have been in the 16th Royal Operating Company, the second longest serving unit in the Western Desert, or any of the many units. Defence. In the early stages of the war, equipment was just not available, so at, our fir at first our only protection was a boxcar with a roof removed with two Bren guns. Later, when guns were captured from the Italians, we had breeder Akiak, and toward the end of the conflict, we had barrage balloons, same as those flown over London. It was impossible to hear an attacking aircraft until they opened up with their cannons and machine guns. Then it was a case of close the regulator, apply the brakes, and leap eight to 14 feet from a train traveling at 20 to 30 miles per hour to maybe safety, possibly onto sand, stones, or even rocks. This was a little rough on the body. Our casualty rate was 35 killed and numerous injuries. When the Germans took over from the Italians, we lost 24 engines in the first week. However, this kind of attack did not cease till after El Alamein. Every day, at least one train was attacked. Capture of a German plane. There are stories of bravery and courage, but there is one that was certainly pushing his luck. Two German planes, Fiesler Storks 156, passed over Marseille and proceeded down the line. The boys, aware that it was not one of ours, notified the other stations. At Halfata, the Germans decided that here was a suitable place to sabotage the line, possibly because it was on a curve. However, at Halfata, we had one of the boys who was perhaps a little trigger happy and had acquired a Spander German machine gun for target practice. What was a better target than two German sabotage? Evidently, the Germans did not like the reception dished out and decided to depart for home. But one plane would not start, so both piled into the other. We had acquired, or captured, a plane. Then the fun started. Our headquarters thought we were pulling their leg. 
But when we convinced them, they had to advise GHQ Cairo. They did not believe them either. So an officer was sent from Cairo the 500 miles to check it out. The Kiwis had the last laugh. Air Commodore Cunningham got himself a new toy for the rest of the desert campaign. Attack on Mossad. Our train was heading towards Kapusa when Air Raid Red was advised at Mossad. We could see that the, that Kapusa was really copying it. The train following had been brought into the siding and the third train was sitting at the points awaiting clearance to enter. Evidently a German bomber, Angel, having dropped his load on Kapusa, decided to follow the line and machine gun anything it saw. The crews of three trains, that's nine men, plus station staff, six men, were standing in front of the station watching the display when the sound of the bomber reached us. The Hinkle, or German bomber, someone else thought it was a wimpy, that's a British bomber. The next thing, the plane was flying at no more than 15 metres high, appeared with guns blazing. The crew in the cockpit, cockpit could be clearly seen. Everyone dropped to the ground and attempted to dig the sand out of hollows in the terrain. As fast as one displaced the sand, someone filled it up for you. As the plane passed over, the rear gunner opened up to add to the confusion. The tracer bullets could be seen, and these seemed to pass through the crowd on the ground. It's amazing no one was hurt but nervous were tested to the extreme. Attack on a train with prisoners of war. On the screen is the result of an attack on a trainload of mainly Italian prisoners by a German pilot, their own troops. The poor devils were mowing down and had no show as they were locked in. The death toll was in the hundreds. They were buried in a communal grave dug by a bulldozer. We actually moved 72,000 prisoners to prison of war camps between 1940 and 1942. 1,000 from Macru, 36,000 from Sydney Barana, 2,500 from Tobruk, 30,000 from Bedia and 3,200 from Salou. 75 men in Tobruk. Lord Haw Haw, a British traitor, the German radio announcer referred to them as the rats of Tobruk, together with the Australian defenders. Men from our companies, all volunteers, were seconded firstly to the British Railway Company, then under the controlling naval officer commanding saloon. They were referred to as the 1018 British Docking Operating Company, operated the barges and wharves. They were from the 10th, 13th, 16th and 17th New Zealand Railway Operating Companies. I have searched New Zealand archives for reference to their activities, but found very little. This is probably the reason that the Defence Department claimed they did not know of us and left us out of the divisional history. We were all non-divisional, so that may also account for it. Tobruk was a hell of a place. They had as many air raids as Malta, but in a shorter space of time. Shorty Raysberg said that when he returned to Alexandria from Tobruk, he knelt down and kissed the ground. He was so happy to be alive. He had returned from hell. 
A sapper's comment. This story was given to me by one of the 16th company, Restukers. It may sound like a dream or a nightmare, but it is very true. A key weapon to Adolf Hitler's massive military machine in the North African campaign, the dreaded Stukas, or dive bombers, were specially equipped with wind-activated sirens to make a screaming sound as they plummaged to earth at high speed. Flying in formation and without warning, they would break away independently to hurtle headlong towards us, shrieking, spinning and whistling. At the exact moment when their bomb doors opened, the screaming would stop and they would soar silently, almost gracefully, back into the sky. Sitting on the floor in the middle of my tent in the western desert, piled up at the edges with sandbags, I put on my tin helmet and wait. In my mind's eye, I imagined that I was in a vast underground bunker. My tin hat became a huge metal umbrella. And if any of the bombs fell at me, I forced myself to believe they would simply ricochet off like harmless hailstones. German booby traps. The most innocent is not always what they appear. The German Air Force flew over our camps at night and spread these horrible things. Cakes of soap. Use them and it would take your skin off. Fountain pens. Touch them and they'd blow your hand off. In any case, it was a hospital case or worse, which was the object of the exercise. A lecture on spying. Shortly after our arrival in Egypt, we were given a lecture on fifth column. The lecturer came on stage in the uniform of a sergeant, saying, you see me as a sergeant, but next time I may be a captain or just be a civilian in clothes. Never ever recognise me, even the walls have ears. Never talk about anything military because we never know who is listening. The screen will show you what might leak out. An example the lecturer gave us. He was walking down the street with a beautiful girl on his arm. An ordinary soldier who knew him said, Good day, Joe. The girl was gone, for she was a German spy. And that comment told her that he was not what he appeared. Six months hard work went down the drain in those three words. This is Egypt who is neutral, and the place was lousy with German and Italian spies trying to get information on you or your units. That information may cost you your life. A little about life in the desert. Even though it was a military offence to keep a diary or write about ourselves, here is a little poem suggesting what one man thought. A soldier's description of Egypt. Land of heat and sweaty socks. Sun and sand and tons of pox. Streets of sorrow. Streets of fame. Streets to which we give no name. Harlots, thieves and pestering wogs. Stinks of dirt and slinking dogs. Blasting heat and aching feet. Jippo guts and camel meat. Clouds of choking dust that blinds, drives a bloke clean off his mind. An Arab's heaven, the soldiers held. Land of bastards, fare thee well. The scorching desert sun 
sometimes as hot as 51 degrees Celsius or 120 degrees Fahrenheit, with no shade, sat unchallenged in the sky for 14 hours a day. We were pestered by sand and flies. We had no shade and little water. Water used in a locomotive was not fit for consumption. The nights brought little respite from the glaring heat. Almost as soon as the sun dipped below the horizon, it became bone achingly cold. The temperatures almost below zero. We shivered in our tents, the cold depriving us of any sleep we might have been able to snatch between the night raids. Despite their best efforts, the RAF was unable to do more than pester the relentless waves. Water. Water was one requirement in the desert almost as important as oil or petrol. The Nile water was so polluted that it was undrinkable. Locals may have used it sometimes, but their lifespan could have been sorely affected. If you fell in the River Nile, you could expect a number of injections from your medic. The 8th Army's water supply was treated to a drinking standard and conveyed in tankers, railway and road to where required. Every unit had its water tanker and went to a central point once every day to collect its quota. Water by rail was conveyed in special tankers labelled as drinking water or otherwise. Water for steam locomotives was as used by the 16th and 17th operating companies was not treated and conveyed in tankers labelled as such. This water was kept in huge wells previously constructed by Roman legions known as burrs. Their capacity was 100,000 gallons, being 75 feet square and 20 feet deep, with a cubic content of 112,500 cubic feet. They were also one day's march for a Roman legion. Their construction would have been between 264 BC and 146 BC during the Punic Wars. Another reason we had to have a fluid water supply was when the Germans retreated, they contaminated all water supplies with salt or oil. This could cause stomach problems. The allocation of water per man was not high and after cooks took their share for food preparation, the average amount per man amounted to one litre, from which it was necessary to drink, clean teeth, shower, wash clothes, and as men would be months in the desert, there were some stinking bodies. Admittedly, we all smelt the same. Showers, while we were on leave, were heaven. Discipline. From the moment we entered the army, we were told what to do. There was no argument. We were young, arrogant, with no all tendencies, which we soon got knocked out of us. You did not answer back for all decisions were made by someone else. Even your life was in the hands of someone else. The worst punishment in the Middle East was the glass house. Freiburg refused to allow New Zealanders to be sent there. Camsins. They are the winds of the desert. The word is Arabic, meaning 50. For these winds can blow for 50 days and 50 nights. The sand can bank up to a foot deep in no time. 
This is the reason I have had part of my guts taken away. I've seen a man who slept on his back have a lot of precious water thrown on his face before he could see. Living conditions. From the very first day we entered the army, we never slept on a pillow. We would roll up our great coat or some of our clothes and sleep on that. Of course, we never had sheets, just pulled a blanket over ourselves. Some of us slept in four or six men tents, and these were usually dug in so only the top of the tent was above ground. And then we would pull a pile of sandbags around this for protection. There were also EPIPs. These slept four men. The top was supported by two poles, and above this, with about an 18 inch gap, was a fly for cooling effect. Most of us were issued with one man bivvies. We just scratched our groove in the sand, erected the tent, and crawled in, hoping not to get a visit from a desert snake, or scorpion, or a kangaroo rat. Friendly bedfellows. A lot of times, we just scraped a hole in the sand and slept under the stars. To aid sleeping, many of us acquired a rubber foam from the seat of a destroyed enemy truck. We would make a hole in the sand, put this in, a soft spot for your hip when you're lying on your side. Flies. You never need worry about being alone. You always had the flies for company. The Egyptian fly is the most fierce, energetic and hungry insect, settling on the face and mouth, infecting the smallest sore and almost driving one crazy. They are prolific breeders and at times in the hot months, thousands can be seen around people and beasts, especially the native boy or girl who do not even bother to remove the fly from their face, especially the eyes or mouth. The worst place I have seen flies was prior to the burial of the dead, especially Germans, for our own dead were usually buried first, as the Germans often booby-trapped the bodies of their dead. At Amaria, there were plantations of dates, and when we approached the packing area, you would swear you had disturbed a beehive. The flies rose in thousands. Even we had, when we attended the 70th anniversary of El Alamein in 2012, the Egyptian wave was very obvious. Food parcels. Food parcels were much appreciated. They were worth their weight in gold. It was Christmas every time they arrived. Fancy eating a piece of Christmas cake. Have you eaten bully beef mixed with sand and not just a few grains? Then for dessert there was bread and butter pudding without the butter. The worst I have had was scrambled eggs for breakfast. Sounds good, doesn't it? Nobody told you the eggs were pigeon eggs and about half were rotten. The cook had only enough to go round with the rotten ones included, so plenty of curry was used to camouflage the taste. Most of the meals were centred around bully beef, backed up occasionally with tin herrings and tomato sauce. It was really amazing what the army cooks could come up with using just bully beef. They boiled it, fried it, made it into patties, rissoles, stews, mixed it with a curry and dehydrated onion, all sorts of ways. Often our evening meal was just a plate of bully straight out of the can, not cooked in any way. This, together with some boiled rice and a hard biscuit, never saw fresh eggs. There was evaporated milk, which came in tins, 
had very little taste, much like skim milk. The only drink we had was tea. Often when we were away from our unit, and that may be for days at a time, we were given hard rations and lived entirely on cold bully, hard biscuits and tinned herrings. And that would be it. How we survived for all that time on such food and under such conditions, I have never ceased to marvel. But if we were not blasted to hell or shot, most of us seem to have come out all right. Now something of a different kind. Scotty Walton's revenge. Scotty was a sergeant and previously had been a pipe major with the Otahu Highland Pipe Band. We were all pleased to have him at the head of every route march with his swelling tunes. Due to some misdemeanor, he was demoted and to punish the OC for being so inconsiderate, he climbed the sand dunes behind the major's tent and played dead marches from 6 p.m. until lights out at 10 p.m. I don't think he ever got the stripe back, but I'll always remember Scotty with bright mood behind him, slow marching on the sand dune alone in the desert. Free entertainment in Alexandria. A group of us staying at the YMCA in Alexandria decided to have a few Stella beers in a bar down the street. On parting the blackout curtain and entering the bar, the band in attendance struck up the tune, Now is the Hour. I, with the cheek of our neck, mounted the stage and sang. They wanted more. After a while, not wishing to overstay my welcome, I attempted to leave the stage. The applause was deafening, particularly from my rowdy friends. On joining them, I commented that I did not realise they had such a love of music. The reply cut me to size. Oh, while you stay up there, we get free beer. Baked beans bombing. Max Wilson and Jack Burke were taking a troop train east. And at the first stop, some of the New Zealanders going on leave asked to have their tin of baked beans to be heated on the boiler. Max agreed, but forgot to punch a hole in the tin. When it heated, it expanded and the crew were bombarded with baked beans. Another short poem, unbeatable. Last night I held a little hand, so dainty and so sweet. I thought my heart would surely break, so wildly did it beat. No other hand in all the world can greater solace bring than that sweet hand I held last night. Four aces and a king. I'll now leave John to take you on to Tripoli and the end of the Western Desert Campaign. Well, I hope you enjoyed those interesting comments by Norm, more personal ones. I'd just like to reflect back to how important the situation was leading up to the Battle of Alamein. The British really had decided that Egypt was lost and evacuation system was in process. The army headquarters, both in Alexandria and Cairo, were destroying their uh, records and bonfires were to be seen all over the place. The civilian population that's the European uh, population, made up of British, uh, French, Greeks and others. They were employees for big companies during the war, before the war. They were, had all started to evacuate and the roads were clogged with vehicles. This is how serious the situation was, was being looked upon. One bank in Alexandria has stated that it paid out one million pounds to people that were wanting to draw out their funds, not knowing what would happen to the currency 
when the Germans took over. This is how serious the situation was being looked upon. Norm has told you about the battle which raged for the artillery for four days, complete bombardment of the enemy forces. Then the British in and uh, New Zealand infantry broke through the, the lines and the tanks came up behind them. Rommel had then decided it was time to draw out. He had been told by Hitler that there must be no retreat. He must fight to the last man. He defied Hitler's order because he wasn't going to sacrifice all his men. And the time had come for him to retreat. And so the Africa Corps then turned and started to escape back through the desert. All those hundreds and hundreds of miles which they'd fought for over now nearly two and a half years. Well, it was a complete shambles at first with all the Africa Corps pouring back along this single road here from Alamein here. They had to retreat all the way back through here and they put up resistances. Rear guard actions were fought to try and slow them down but the British were far too strong. They rolled on. By this time the Germans had already lost 32,000 men, 1,000 guns and at least 450 tanks. Now at the same time Germany gets another shock. On the 8th of November American and British troops land in Algiers and Morocco. So he's now going to be faced with an army on both sides, both his front and rear. Rather an interesting picture here is that there are a lot of wadis in the desert. There are old dry riverbeds which shows that at some time the place was quite fertile and there was water around. But these are long, over hundreds of years, have all dried up but the old riverbeds are still there and these had to be bridged. So the, the road through the desert was met with many, many of these bridges. They were always left uh, because the retreating British and later the, the uh, retreating Germans, the way the, the desert war flowed backwards and forwards, the bridges were never destroyed because they thought that at one stage when they, when they fought back they would need them. But on this particular occasion, Rommel knew that the game was up and he'd never come back. So he blew up the bridges as he retreated. And this picture shows you how they tackled the situation. The British engineers would go in, clear a track down the river bank, put a small crossing over the river bed itself, and then another track up the other side. And this picture shows the, the tracks negotiating this situation. We now go on and to Brook Falls on the 15th of December. So that's from October to December. The battles were fought and the retreat uh, took place. And on the 15th of December, the British roll into Tobruk. The next real um, defeat for the Germans was at Benghazi, uh, which was reached on the 20th of November. So here we were. Uh, back where we'd been twice before. It was rather interesting. But this time, of course, we didn't stop. It was clear that, uh, that the British were winning and the Rommel had to retreat all the time. Benghazi fell on the 20th of November. Rommel put up no defence as he realised he was up against 300 Shermans and the mass, masses of six-pounder anti-tank guns that cannot be used against his panzers. On the 23rd of January, three months to the day of the Alamein battle, Allied troops marched into Tripoli. This was a wonderful victory because we now had the harbour. Up to this point, the army, the British army had to be supplied from Alexandria, which was now nearly a thousand miles behind. So with the advantage of a port, we could now start to bring the, our supplies in. 
The Germans, on the other hand, of course, lost their source of supply, and they had to then revert to the uh, Tunis in Tunisia. Mussolini had great plans, and he built and he did a lot for both Italy and his new conquered countries. And he built some beautiful um, structures, roads, and beautiful buildings. And this is a shot I got of one of his buildings. Remember that this was taken 70 years ago. And look how modern it looks, even on today's standards. And here we have another. Another thing he did was to push uh, the desert back. Once the desert gets water, it's quite fertile. And in some place, he pushed it back as far as three miles. And the colonists, there were over 100,000 Italian colonists there and they were growing crops for Italy. And one of the things that he was very fond of doing was building olive groves to supplement the need for olive oil. So when we re-arrived there, we were camped about two and a half miles out of Tripoli. And of course it was wonderful after over two years in the desert to see trees and grass again. And this is a picture of our orderly room. It's an EPIP, which we mentioned before. And you'll see the trees, there are the olive trees and the poppies. Fortunately, the poppies were out, and to us it was an absolutely beautiful scene. And you may be interested in this little story. This was a, a photograph which I had processed, or got processed in Cairo when I got back. I developed my own films, which is quite another story, but uh, I, I never bothered about prints, but on this occasion, I sent the uh, negative in and it was processed in Cairo and I got back a postcard. I also carried a little set of hand colouring photographic watercolours and I coloured this little picture there, put it in an envelope in a letter to my mother. And I'd forgotten all about it and about, oh, I think my mother passed away and about 50 years later I was going through my letters which she'd saved in a box and this picture fell out and I'd forgotten all about it, so it was rather a nice little souvenir of um, something that happened so long ago. And going on now, this is a picture of the very, very important port that we now had. This is the Tripoli Harbour, and in it you'll see a Liberty ship here in the uh, centre here. This is a very, very famous, it's one of 1700 ships which were built during the war to replace the tremendous losses of the Allies were losing in the uh, Atlantic, on the Atlantic convoys. And the, these ships were built, uh, or put together, I should say, in 14 days from the laying of the keel, which is, is absolutely incredible. They were made in America uh, under a British design, and they really, uh, some people say, they saved the war because they replaced all these ships which were being lost. Uh, this is another shot of, of Tripoli and the promenade which, which went around it. Just remember this promenade on the next little story I'm going to tell you. Naturally, the harbour became a target for the German bombers. And they would come over at night bombing the tremendous pileup of shipping which had just arrived to satisfy the needs of the 8th Army which was, was now stationed about 20 miles out of Tripoli. Now, what used to happen that they would come over at night time and bomb and try and attempt to bomb the harbour. The idea was to set up a anti-aircraft barrage, which they did, and they positioned bofers, bofer anti-aircraft guns, uh, around the immediate closeness to, to this uh, harbour here, and bofer was a a gun which shot up uh, missiles. The, the bullets were about about that long and about about that round and they were four in the clip and they would go off bang 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 and there were traces and they were coloured and uh, the reds and greens and yellows from memory and from a distance you would see them travelling up but they looked as though they were travelling quite slowly and when they reached their altitude, they'd go off bang, 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 and it was a very pretty scene. Uh, and they, the guns were placed in a, in a situation where they exploded in a, in a grid pattern. 
So one would explode here, another one there, another one there, and they'd form up a grid. Now above that, about a couple of miles or a mile and a half out of town, they put a ring of high altitude anti-aircraft. And that was, that was above this layer of the Bofors. And they did exactly the same thing. So in effect, they created a cube of flying flak. So the idea was that the, the bombers would get in first, catch them unawares, do their bombing and get out before this barrage started up. We didn't have radar. The, the, the radar never reached the desert. It was confined to, to, it was a new invention and it was used in Britain most of the time. But we did have what they call listening devices. And these were great big horns which were set up along the coast to receive the sound of engines in the distance. And that, that was then put through a listening device which magnified the sound and people with earphones on could hear the sound of approaching enemy before it was heard by the human ear. Now these devices were situated along the coast and were connected by a cable, uh, a landline, which was just a piece of wire dragged out across the desert. And they all came into a, a central control and that control then alerted the guns that the, that the enemy were approaching before they were heard by the human ear. Now, the Germans planned one night a very, very big raid. But they wanted to catch the British by surprise. And they had quite a number of Arabs that were working for them. They, they were called Fifth Column. And on the night just before, as the raid was approaching, the uh, Fifth Columnists crept in over the sand and cut the, the, the land lines, which were just lying on top of the sand. So the information did not get through to the guns and the Germans got in over the harbour before the anti-aircraft barrage went off. Um, they did a lot of destruction. I think five ships were hit and one of them was an ammunition ship. Um, but then the barrage started and what it did, of course, all the planes, I think there were about eight at the time, were caught in this mass of flying flak and they tumbled out of the sky. Um, now, an anti-aircraft barrage is a, a rather a, a be beautiful sight to see. Um, this is a picture I took of a, a barrage, not of Tripoli. I was too far. I did see the Tripoli barrage, but as I say, we were about a couple of miles away from it, so I was not able to get a picture. This is a picture I did take of a, an air raid and an anti-aircraft barrage. It'll give you just some idea of the intensity of it. It's a time exposure, I think from memory, probably about three seconds. These streaks here you see going up are uh, the Bofors. Of course, being a time exposure, you're getting a streak. But in, in actuality, they're all pretty, pretty colors. They're reds and greens and yellows. And uh, as you can see, they would make quite a pretty sight. The, 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 the white spots, they're away in the distance and, and these ones are a little bit closer and then you see these ones up here. The, these are the, uh, the high altitude um, shells going off. And the white streaks here are searchlights. Uh, I have here some flak. After the, the night of the raid, I had a friend who drove one of the trucks and he said, I'm going into Tripoli. Would you like to come in for a ride? And I said, oh yeah, that'd be great. So we went in and he said, oh, let, let's have a walk around the waterfront. And uh, that promenade which you saw in the earlier picture, and we walked along there. Well, now everything that goes up has got to come down. And the place was absolutely littered with flak. Here, here are the little pieces here that I picked. I leant down and picked up three pieces of this flat. Now just imagine these sharp things flying through the sky and imagine them being uh, even hit with one of those pieces. It, it was a tremendous amount of damage. 
So those are little souvenirs I have of the, of the, uh, of the war. Now we go on to, there was a big build up now, a pause and a build up on the border. This is Tunisia here and this is Libya here and here's the border, you can see it. So there's a pause while all the supplies now came in through Tripoli, the 8th Army built up uh, Rommel and the Africa Corps were being supplied from Tunis. All right on the border here is a defence line. Uh, Tunisia was a French colony and the French were a bit concerned that Mussolini would, in, would uh, now, having got Libya, would invade them. So they set up, there was a line, the, and incidentally, the desert really finishes here. This is more vegetated. And there was a line of hills which enabled a defence line to be set up. This line of defence was called the Marath Line. So we have the British now centred here, and the Germans have retreated and have taken up defence against this Marath Line. The attack to break this line came one night, and they used the New Zealand Division to do one of their tricks and it's called a left hook. And the idea is that they disappear into the desert and they travel behind the enemy lines, then suddenly attack the enemy from the back. And they use the New Zealand division to, to complete this breakthrough. So you have the, the enemy lined up in this hills here and the British army are here. And so one night, the New Zealand division dived down here, swung round, and came back through what they called the Wilders Gap. And it was a gap that was, that was discovered by the Long Range Desert Group. And so they started then, the, the Germans found they were being attacked from the back and the front, big barrage opened up in the front and of course there was a breakthrough. And the German army were once again in retreat. This will give you a picture a little bit better. This is Tunisia. And this is the Marath line here. And the New Zealanders escaped round here, came in through the back here, through this gap here, and attacked them from the back. The Germans had nothing else to pull up stakes and retreat back up through here. Sfax was one of the towns. Seuss was another. And here is Tunis, the capital up here. And you must remember also at the same time, the Americans and British were, were coming in from the west. So Germany was now in this area here being attacked by the 8th Army here and the Americans and British coming in from here. They got as far, they retreated far as back as Infeedable, yes here it is here, Infeedable. And there's a right range of hills here. Just another little interesting personal story. Uh, this is Seuss, well up into Tunisia, and uh, the Germans were being supplied by uh, shipping. It was a small, very small harbour, but they were bringing supplies into them, and so they got the Americans to bomb it. Now, shortly after that, we were stationed just, just near here, and a friend of mine said to me, he said, let's see if we can go in and have a look at Seuss. Well, we've never seen a bomb, so we'd seen them on pictures of them of European but of course there were no towns in where we were fighting and uh, we thought it'd be rather interesting to go and see a, a bombed town because we'd heard it had been bombed rather heavily. So we were lined up there and of course it was out of bounds to all troops. Um, so we went in and dug up the town major and <laughs> strung a story over. I won't, I won't tell you what the story was but in the process he, he gave me this slip of paper. I'll put it on the screen so you can see it. And it reads, <coughs> Corporal Johnston has permission to enter Seuss, but not, underlined, the docks. Why not the docks? I'm not too sure. Signed by the town major. So we got into Seuss. 
And here are some of the pictures that I took. You can see here how badly bombed it was. Incidentally, there were no civilians. Uh, they'd, they'd all been told to evacuate. And of course, at the time we, we took, as I took the picture, the, uh, it was out of bounds to all troops. So uh, my friend and I virtually were, re were in this place on, on our own. That's another shot. You can see how badly it was damaged. Uh, they, they supposed to have been only bombing the docks, but they really got into the town itself. It was ter 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 terribly knocked around, but it was rather interesting for us to see. And that's, a, that's as close as I dare get to the docks. So um, I didn't dare to go anymore because I was told not to go to the docks. For some reason, I don't know. But that just gives you a little bit of an idea of what, what the damage that the bombing did. The town was completely wrecked, except, and the only thing was that the harbour was the, was the main target. Now this is another interesting story which has come up. We were walking along the beach one day, a friend and I, we had a little time off, so we went for a walk along the beach. And as we were walking along the beach, we heard the sound of an aero engine behind us. And we looked around and we saw this plane approaching. We knew immediately from recognition that it was a Wellington bomber, because we were quite familiar with those. But then as it got a little bit closer, we found that there was something that had been added to it. And we couldn't believe our eyes when we saw it. It had a great big circle around it. And as it went overhead, I grabbed my camera and I took a picture of it. I, we had no idea what it, what it was about. And then it moved on later and I got another picture of it just as it was going on down the coast. Now what it was, we found out, oh, months, perhaps a year later, that it was a very, very secret device. Uh, the Germans dropped, as we know, mines. Mines are exploded by a ship hitting them and then blowing them up. But then the mine sweepers would go out, sweep the different areas for mines. So they, they devised another way. They would drop the mine by a parachute and it would sink to the ocean where it would be anchored. This was only used in, in shallow waters and it was locked to the bottom. But it was detonated by the magnetic impulse that a ship's hull generates. Evidently, a ship's hull generates a magnetic impulse. And this was picked up by the mine, which would then explode. Because there's no way of clearing these mines, because once, once they were on the, on the seabed, they, they automatically became active. And uh, mine sweepers, of course, couldn't touch them. And they started to do a lot. They dropped them around the entrances to harbours, particularly, and they did quite a lot of damage. Now, to get over this problem, there's, there's a, when there's a problem, there's always an answer. And the British immediately got onto it by a s system which they called degaussing. And degaussing was a, a cable which was put around the hull of the ship, and into that was put in an electrical current which was directly opposite to the current that the ship was the ship's hull was discharging and so it, it neutralized it so that it wouldn't set off these bombs and this system worked so the ship sort of sailed through but then there were a lot of bombs of course still left unexploded and uh, ships that went degaussed because they went all degaussed were, were suffering, so they devised a way of blowing them up from the air. And this is what this plane was. It was a circle round the, um, the ship which, which sent down a, an electrical current, the same as a ship's hull, and blew up the mine. Now, Norman here has got a rather an interesting story because he has something to say about this because it was top secret at the time and not very many people knew about it. Oh, Norman. Well, I doubt, that, I doubt whether there was very many of these planes about because I think it was something that was on the secret list. But our company was camped near the Suez Canal. And each morning 
between 5 and 6 o'clock in the morning, this plane would appear and would fly up and down the Suez Canal. And it was quite interesting to see the mines exploding behind it. They actually got one boat, the Emden. They, uh, they had to dig a hole right round it. But after that, they used this plane and the, it solved the problem. But it was most interesting to see it fly up and down first thing in the morning because the Germans had been over sprinkling the mines in during the night. Yeah, it's interesting to note here that the plane had to fly in an exact height to explode this one. It was too high, it wouldn't work, and a two little bit below, of course, would be too dangerous for the plane. And so it had, had to fly exactly, and it had to be, and it was operating near the coastline, so I would assume that the shipping was coming in here and coming in quite close to the coast because we weren't very far from the harbour and I would assume that it was operational at the time because of the situation. Now, <laughs> this meant that if there had been any mines here uh, we mightn't have been here now because it would, we were in a very, very dangerous situation but of course we didn't know what it was. And, um, and that's the story about it the... It was interesting. The they had to f fly at a certain speed. Otherwise, they didn't explode the mine. And they had to fly at a, at a certain height. If they were too slow, they're liable to get the tail blown off. This is uh, the unfeedable line. It was the last point of resistance of the Africa Corps in the African War. It was so that they were able to put up a very, very strong defence against the approaching 8th Army. And this is as far as the, the 8th Army got in Tunisia. Because at the same time as they had stopped the 8th Army, the uh, Americans and, Br and British had come in behind them, and so they were trapped. As I say, this is the final uh, distance that we got up into Tunisia before the war actually ended. Just a few little pictures here I'd like to... I was naturally interested in photography and uh, carried the camera with me, and uh, I was also interested in aviation. Now, getting photographs of airplanes with a, with a little camera I had and no zoom lenses in those days, and I didn't have a telephoto lens, so it was almost an impossibility, but I persevered, and this is a shot of Baltimore bombers. This is just in that area where I've just shown you, in Feedable, and these are going out each morning. They went out in flights. You'll see them going out there to, to bomb the enemy lines. They got a terrible pounding. And there were flights of these and flights of Boston's and flights of Wellington's and they would go out and this shot early morning I got of the Baltimore's coming out. This is another lovely shot, it's one of my favourites. This is a Dakota, a DC-3, uh, taking off from a desert airstrip and I heard the roar of the motors because I didn't carry the camera with me all the time. I mean, to say it was, that was impossible. It was, it was in my gear and on my kit bag, and I'd have to, if I wanted to use it, I'd have to dive in and try and get it out. And I heard this engine starting up. We were camped just a little way from the airfield. I thought, oh, gee, I might see something here. And as I, just as I came out, and I had my camera ready, this DC-3, you see, just, just lifting off from the desert. Oh, it, was a, it was a lovely shot. Very hard to get, but I got it. Uh, this is, I had to put this one in. This is uh, uh, not terribly uh, good, but but it, it's Spitfires. We had, we had to have some Spitfires in. And this is a, a shot of three three Spitfires. See, the planes would, would take off and they'd climb very quickly and they're were, they were right out of vision. It's only when they came down low that you, you got them. But uh, I don't know how I got that, but or why the planes were came down so low but I just happened to be there and I just happened to have my camera at the time. So that's the only shot I really got of any Spitfires during the war. I'm very proud of that one. 
And uh, the last one here, which is probably my best uh, aerial shot of the whole war, this is a hurricane. And I think he was probably a New Zealand airman, and he knew that some of his mates were down below. He knew where they were camped. And he came in and did a victory roll. I, I don't know what brought him down, because they're not supposed to have done that. And so he swept down over the camp, rolled over, and just as he was climbing out again, I got this gorgeous shot. And it's a hurricane, and it's turned out to be, I didn't know it at the time, <clears throat> but it turned out to be a very special one. If you look very closely, you'll see cannons on, the, on each wing. There's two of them, one on each wing. They took out the machine guns and put in these cannons, and it was used as, as an anti-tank device. And they used them in the desert to shoot up anti-tanks and armoured vehicles because the ordinary armament of uh, the Spitfires and the Hurricanes would not penetrate the tanks. But these ones had large cannons on them and they could destroy a tank. So it was rather a special plane and, to me, um, the best picture I, I got of aircraft during the war. Right, so we go on now to the end. The... Allied forces, that's the Americans and British, pushed in through here. Here's Tunis here. Rommel, oh, not Rommel, because Rommel had gone back to Germany by now, but the Africa Corps were being attacked from behind, infeatable here. So you had both attacks, they were locked into this area here. They retreated to Tunis, then fired Tunis here. And finally, both armies defeat, ran up into this part here. And that was the end of them. They were locked. They, they were locked in Cape Bon, and they only had the ocean around them. They had nowhere to go. And the only thing that they could do, of course, was surrender. And 150,000... Germans laid down their arms. Uh, it was a tremendous defeat for the Germans and the Italians and of course a tremendous victory for us because it was the end of the war in, in Africa. Well, <clears throat> what happens when you get half a million people suddenly landed on your lap? What the hell are you going to do with them? And so they built a, a wire fence and shoved them all into there what they did for food, I don't know. They probably didn't give them any food. They're only there overnight, most of them. And toilets read, really, I don't know what happened there. But the next morning, they loaded them onto trucks. Now, we were here, just, this is infeasible. We were, this is where we were. And we knew the war was over. Tunis was in Allied hands. So we were then started to proceed up to Tunis. This is the day after the capitulation. And we ran into trucks. This is an amazing picture because these are trucks loaded with Italian and German prisoners. Some of their own trucks, some of ours. And they were driving themselves without any armed guards or anything back to prisoners of war camps. It's, it's an absolutely amazing picture. I've never ever seen, in all the books that I've read after the war, I've never ever seen this particular situation. We were, of course, were heading up to Tunis because uh, that was our final destination. And I don't know who it was, but it was a real dirty trick played on the New Zealand division. Might have been politicians. I don't think it was, I don't think it was the army. I don't think they would have done it. I think it must have been a political thing. They said to us, <coughs> No, you're not going to Tunis, you're going back to Egypt. Now why the decision was made, I don't know, because it was a terrible decision to make, because nobody more than the New Zealanders had contributed to the war, and yet they were done out of their prize. They never got to Tunis. They never, they were never participated in the tremendous victory celebrations that were held there. Churchill went over, there were big parades, and the New Zealanders, well, we were on our way back to Egypt. 
it was a terrible decision. I don't know who made it. It's hard to know. Just one little thing was this. I saw this town going up and it passed by and I thought, oh gee, that would have made a lovely picture. And I sort of forgot about it. And then three or four days, might have been a week later, we were on our way back. This is when we were on our way back to Egypt. And I thought, oh, that town will be coming up. It's called Karawan. And I said to the driver, well, when Karawan comes up, would you let me know? So uh, he did, and he yelled out, Karawan coming up! And I was in the back of this truck, and I scrambled to the back, put my hand up onto the canopy rail, took my camera out, got it all set up, lined it hard against my forehead to stop all the jerking of the trucks, leaned out over the back of the truck, they're doing about 68 in convoy, so we couldn't stop, of course, and, and I leaned out over the track, and as the village went back, I got it. And I think I got it well. So it's, it's one of my nice little pictures of the war, as I saw it. Now, part of our journey back, I won't go through it, it took 18 days, travelling every day, we went back, right back through all the roads as I show that long Tarsiel Road, all the way back to Mardi, our camp in near Cairo. But we did have to pass through the Alamein battlefield. And of course this brought back a lot of memories. And I got a couple of shots here that I'd like to show you just to finish off. This is the battlefield, as it was months later, where on the 23rd of October, 42, this world-known battle took place, one of the biggest battles in the world has ever known, I think. And this is the, the, the battlefield. An interesting thing I'll make just at this point. <clears throat> I was determined to develop my own films because I didn't want to send them into Cairo because I didn't know how the development would be, because I thought I might want these at some later stage. And I wanted to be sure they were washed particularly, washed properly, so I organised, I won't go into the whole details, but I organised a setup where I could develop my films back in base camp, which I did when I got back there each time. But I never had any prints done. So I took these hundreds of pictures, and I never saw prints from them. I was quite happy just to take the photographs, it wasn't until years later that I saw them. Sixty years later, I decided to write a book about my experiences and use some of the photographs which I'd taken. And I dug them out of this, this, this tin which they'd been stored in and uh, produced them in this book. But one of the, the uh, pictures in particular, which I want to refer to now, and the comments that I made about it, just to end the little session. These are the trucks of the, you'll see the long line of trucks, the, the convoy. Incidentally, <coughs> the convoy of the New Zealand Division was fully mobile. And there were 6,000 6, trucks, would you believe, and it was split into two, two parts, this convoy, 3,000 each day. Now, you can see they're very, very close, the 10 seconds between each one. Now, if you just stood on the side of the road, it would have taken three hours to pass. That's how big it was. And you can see them, look, see they tail off right away, away in the distance, and they're all the one way behind us. So this is the picture that I took of us passing through the Alamein battleground. And the comments that I made about this, which I think are rather significant now. In the steady stream, trucks of the now famous New Zealand Division roll on past this historic battleground. For the thousands of young lads on those trucks, this is an emotional moment. Memories of what took place here on the 23rd of October 1942 and the days that followed, the terrifying and ghastly events 
the horror of war, of blood and death, all these things will be etched in their minds forever. Though most may never pass this way again, there is one thing that is certain. For the rest of their lives, they will never forget El Ahamain. And Norm and I, we'll never forget that. All the things that have passed in the years, a lot of it we've forgotten. But we'll never, never forget Alamein. <laughs>